Like many people, when you hear the term social network, you probably think of Facebook or some other online platform that connects you to peers, family, and the world. But that is just a very contemporary version of something that's been around much longer. And that is the subject of historian Neil Ferguson's new book. It's called The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power from the Freemasons to Facebook. And we're delighted to welcome Neil Ferguson back to our studio for more. So good to see you again. Good to be back here, Steve. Okay, we, we just have to set this up a little bit because the last time you were here was to talk to us about your 1,000 page volume one of Henry Kissinger. And then somehow, I gather, in the midst of working on volume two, you thought you'd punch out just a, an impertinent little 500 page book on the square and the tower. Uh, okay, what insight into writing the Kissinger book did you get about this that obviously took you off in a different direction for a little while anyway? There is a connection and in some ways I had to write this book before I could even begin to write the second volume of Kissinger. I have a hypothesis about that second volume which is that the reason Henry Kissinger became so powerful in the 1970s was that he built a network that was unrivaled and that, that Kissinger understood before other people that the world was shifting to being more networked and less hierarchical. Most of his contemporaries thought that if you were in the federal government, what mattered was the org chart, where you were in relation to the president. But somehow Kissinger intuitively understood that that was passe and that the future really belonged to people who could network outside the org chart. So part of what I do in this book is explore that hypothesis by showing how his network operated. And that will be a theme of the second volume. But I knew I couldn't write that until I properly understood the theory and history of networks. And so this is a book attempted, attempting to educate me as well as the reader about, about how social networks operate where they came from, and to show that Silicon Valley did not invent them. Hmm. I'm going to go off the path of this book just for a second, only insofar as to ask, somewhere along the line, either your wife or your publisher or somebody must have said, wait a second, you're supposed to do two books on Henry Kissinger, and now you want to do 500 pages on... Neil, what's wrong with you? Oh, they're used to me by now, Steve. I mean, this is my 15th book, and, and my publishers and indeed my wife know that one thing leads to another, and intellectually I had to make this detour, and, and I'm really glad I made it. It was an incredible fun book to write because I was able to delve into stuff that I'd been interested in for decades, but had never dared to really investigate. A good example being the Illuminati. Now, if you go online and do some Googling and enter the crazy world of conspiracy theories, you will find all kinds of fascinating connections from Henry Kissinger to George Soros, to the Rothschilds, to the Illuminati, to aliens from outer space. Uh, it's a kind of crazy world. Not many serious historians dare to venture into that world and to see whether there ever were Illuminati. So I thought, what fun to actually write the history of the social networks and the secret societies that by and large only conspiracy theorists write about. So I'm glad I made this detour. And now I'm ready for volume two. I kind of needed a <laughs> mental health break. Okay, good, because we want you back here for volume two. Oh yeah. But since you mentioned the Illuminati and you do do a chapter on them in the book, uh, I don't want to assume everybody knows who they mm. are. So let's let's just start with who were they and what did they want to do in this world? Well, there, there are two answers to that question. There's the conspiracy theory answer, which some of your viewers will be familiar with, oh, I don't know, from Dan Brown or from, uh, from other, some other source in popular culture. In the, in the pop culture version, there is a sinister, secret, all-powerful society that controls everything from the Federal Reserve to the World Economic Forum, and we are mere puppets on the ends of the strings that they control. The history answer, the correct answer, is that in the 1770s, in South Germany, in Bavaria, a secret society was indeed formed, which was indeed called the Illuminati, but the goal of that secret society was to infiltrate the Freemasons, the Masonic lodges of Europe, and to spread through that network radical ideas of the Enlightenment, uh, including even ideas that questioned Christianity. So this existed, but didn't last long. By, by about the 1780s, uh, it was closed down by the Bavarian authorities who viewed its religious teachings with deep suspicion. And so by the time of the French Revolution in 1789, the Illuminati had essentially been destroyed and their founder, Manet Weishaupt, had, uh, had retreated into exile in Coburg. End of story. But the story kind of resumes again mm -hmm. after the French Revolution, when opponents of the revolution start to claim that the Illuminati and indeed the Freemasons caused the French Revolution. And that's the beginning of a conspiracy theory that has run and run 
right down to the present day, inspiring authors and, uh, and indeed conspiracy theorists. Uh, so from my vantage point, this is a fascinating example uh, of what the book is about. That social networks, some secret and some massive and open, have existed throughout history, uh, but we don't have very good histories of those social networks, partly because conspiracy theorists are drawn to the subject, and partly because it's really hard to do. Because secret societies don't leave archives with, you know, the Illuminati archive that you can just go and study. Uh, it's actually quite hard to track down the, the documents that reveal the true history of the Illuminati. Sa same applies to Freemasonry. For many, many years, it was hard to write any serious history of Freemasonry because the lodges kept their archives closed. I wrote a history of the Rothschild Bank at one time. That was another subject that attracted conspiracy theorists, partly because the archives were inaccessible. So it's only relatively recently that some of these societies have been open to the kind of serious academic research that I believe in. And the square and the tower is an attempt to say, you know what, there is some truth to these stories, uh, but it's very, very different from the conspiracy theory version that you'll get online. Why do you suppose the Illuminati story persists to this day? I think we are attracted to conspiracy theories. I think it's partly gratifying for people to imagine that behind the uh, news headlines and the mainstream media, there's a real story. It, it turns out that a really high proportion of people in the United States believe some version of the proposition that behind the scenes, a secret elite of finance controls everything. Yeah, trilateral commission or whatever right. it is. And, yeah. and you know, there's a very powerful uh, set of conspiracy theories that still attach uh, to George Soros, the hedge fund manager. So I think part of the reason that these conspiracy theories are so prevalent is that they satisfy some psychological desire to believe that we really know what's going on. The other reason that they persist is that there is some kernel of truth. It's not like George Soros doesn't exist. He does. It's not like he's not incredibly rich. He's incredibly rich. He does have some power and influence. We saw him at Davos this very week at the World Economic Forum, essentially calling out President Trump. So there is some kernel of truth to the proposition that George Soros is a powerful and influential man. And when you see him at Davos at the World Economic Forum, he's right there in one of the most powerful networks in the world. It's just that it's not as powerful as conspiracy theorists tend to say. Somehow they can't resist the leap to the proposition, oh, they control everything. And I've been to the World Economic Forum. Believe me, they don't control everything. There isn't a meeting where they sit down and plan the coming year and how the elections are going to turn out. Disappointingly, it, it turns out that the world's financial elite doesn't really even control the financial system very well. Remember the financial crisis? Indeed. Trust me, they didn't plan that. <laughs> Uh, let me ask you about the Freemasons, because not too long ago in that chair, we had somebody who wrote uh, a book about uh, a particular politician in the history of this province and pointed out that not that long ago, I don't know, maybe 50 years ago, 80 to 90 percent of the members who were part of the cabinet of the government of Ontario were Freemasons. Yeah. Uh, there is a suggestion somehow, or there will be among some, that there's something nefarious about yeah. that. Are they right to, to be suspicious about that? I think they're wrong and that nefarious isn't the word. But if you looked at the history of Scotland, where I come from, in the same kind of period, let's say through the 19th century into the first half of the 20th century, you'd find a similar story. Because the Freemasonry, which had its roots in Scotland and then spread to wherever the Scots were numerous, places like Canada, was a big part of the social life of men, notice men, uh, in that period. It gets going in the 18th century as a social movement. It's a place where people can dine together, exchange ideas together, regardless of their social class. The theory was that rank didn't matter whether you were an aristocrat or a commoner. Uh, and religion, religious divisions were also uh, underplayed because of Freemasonry's connection to deism as opposed to any particular Christian sect. So it's a very important social network on both sides of the Atlantic. It's true in the United States too, as I show in the book. A very big part of the American Revolution uh, is connected to Masonic lodges. But nefarious, I don't think so, in the sense that they're not meeting at these lodges and plotting uh, to defraud the public. Oh, uh, their eye is on the money, right? Well, there's obviously money involved because mm -hmm. many of the people in Masonic lodges are in business. Mm -hmm. And I think as a consequence of the networks that were built through the Masonic lodges, there was a certain privileged uh, elite. If you were in that network, you had an advantage in politics, 
and in business. But this is the kind of advantage that you encounter in other parts of the world through other kinds of social networks. The Chinese have a word for this, guanxi. Mm. Connectedness or connections, the way that China works today is somewhat similar. If you're in the network, if you're connected, then you're going to get the deals and you're going to have the access. So I think one of the points I make in the book is that this is the way that humans work. It just varies from period to period how the network is organized. Freemasonry had its glory days, really, from the late 18th century to the mid 20th century. And now I think we'd find it's pretty much gone. Uh, and cease to be a factor in Canadian, American, British politics. Politically, uh, yes, but I mean they're still around raising money for hospitals and that kind of thing. Absolutely, but they're not what they once were right. as a political network. Uh, different things have taken the place of that, and what's fascinating to me is the way in which social networks are always morphing, they're always changing, and new networks can come along and quite quickly displace the old ones. Well, let's talk about the best example of that, Facebook. Right. We now have a social network that, that connects almost Anybody who wants, I mean, billions, right? Billions of people who, who yeah, choose to be a part billion. of this. More than two billion. More than two billion. What do you believe to be the consequences of one social network like Facebook having such an utterly dominant position in our world today? Well, if you asked Mark Zuckerberg that question, certainly a couple of years ago, he would have said, well, it's awesome. Everything is awesome about this because the more people who are connected, the more likely we are to solve all the great problems that face our planet. And his project for a while was to build a global community. That was one of his favorite phrases. And I think Silicon Valley generally believe that if we just connected everybody, that would be great. The shock horror revelation is that there are risks to very high levels of connectedness, that if you build a giant online social network of two billion plus people, it won't just be a, ve a venue for cat videos to be shared. What became clear in 2016 was that a networked world has some, some big downside risks. One of them, which I think is a very striking feature in the US, but I don't think it's uniquely US, uh, is polarization. So people on large or even small social networks don't just congregate together in one big cluster. What tends to happen is a certain self-segregation. Uh, in the United States today, it's an ideological distinction. People who are liberals essentially share uh, with people who are liberals and conservatives do the same. And there's amazingly little traffic between these clusters. So one big problem that I think has arisen from the prevalence of uh, online networks is the polarization that was already there in our political life uh, is getting worse because the algorithm encourages encourages us to hang out with people who are like-minded. in our echo chambers. In the echo chamber, in the filter bubbles. I think that's one problem. I'll, I'll mention one more, which I think is very relevant to your, your viewers. And that is the way in which crazy stuff goes viral. There is no law that says only good things go viral. Actually, it turns out that quite often bad things are more likely to go viral because we're interested in fake news and in extreme views. So one thing that Facebook has turned out to be is a fantastic transmission mechanism for downright lies. And a good example was the story that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump mm -hmm. in 2016. Yeah. People found that fascinating, perhaps understandably. There was only one problem. It was completely untrue. But by the time an idea like that has been shared between, well, probably not as many as 2 billion people, let's say 150 uh, you know, million, that is still potentially influential on an election outcome roughly the same number of people as voted in the US presidential election of 2016 saw fake news that was generated by the Russians. I mean, that's a staggering thought. That was not part of Mark Zuckerberg's plan when Facebook was set up. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And yet we're sure it had no impact on the outcome of the election, right? <sighs> well, I don't think it was decisive in the, in the sense that, although that sounds like a big impact, when you measure the share of all the content on Facebook during the election that was accounted for by the Russians, it's tiny. Because content on Facebook is just mind-bogglingly voluminous. Mm -hmm. Billions and billions and billions of things get shared on Facebook in the space of a year. But you never know what's influential. Right. But we can see uh, that in that extraordinary period around Donald Trump's rise to power, uh, although the Russians were certainly playing in the Facebook space, they were a relatively small part of what was being generated. Most of the content, including most of the fake news, was domestic in origin. It was being generated by ordinary American users of Facebook. Uh, so I think what we should realize here is not that the Russians decided the election, I think that goes too far, but that Facebook was decisive. No Facebook, no Trump. Without Facebook, I'm pretty sure he could not have won that election. People tend to emphasize his Twitter feed. 
it was the campaign's use of Facebook's advertising tools that really decided the outcome. And the Clinton campaign, by comparison, was flat-footed, didn't understand the power of Facebook advertising. And I think one of the most important things we all have to understand, Canadians as well as Americans, Brits too, indeed anybody in any democracy, is that the Facebook advertising tool is now the most powerful weapon in any election campaign. You call it a weapon. It is a weapon. Interesting choice of words. Absolutely. It's a much more powerful weapon than television advertising because it's so precise and it gives you instant feedback. You can tell which adverts are hitting which demographic most effectively. This was very obvious in the Brexit campaign, which preceded Trump's victory. The Leave campaign, the anti-European campaign, understood the Facebook tool and it was able to calibrate its advertising, target its advertising at the people that it really wanted to influence. And I think this is a much more powerful weapon in politics than people generally appreciate. Though, believe me, they get it at Facebook because they realized, mm -hmm. wow, we can make a lot of money from this kind of uh, advertising. Mm -hmm. I think this has changed the public sphere. The place where ideas are exchanged has been irrevocably altered by the emergence of giant online social networks. And I don't think we fully comprehend how big that change is. Shall we do an excerpt from the book? By all means. Let's. Sheldon, bring this excerpt up, if you would. Here's what you have to say about this. Facebook promised to create an interconnected world of netizens, but its structure was profoundly inegalitarian. Facebook has 15,724 employees and close to 2 billion users, but only the tiniest fractions of these groups actually own Facebook stock. The global social network, in other words, is itself owned by an exclusive network of Silicon Valley insiders. That does sound nefarious. Do you mean it to? Well, again, it's not nefarious. They didn't set out uh, to achieve this. But the reality of the way that these network platforms have evolved is that they quickly become quasi-monopolies. I mean, there's no other social network that can compete with Facebook. The MySpaces have forgotten. Uh, and because they're relatively easy to run, they don't require the employees that General Motors require. They're, they're quite small. Um, the, the money that flows in from online advertising is mind-blowing. We're talking billions every quarter. And the founder, of course, has a pretty large share of the equity. It's not like Zuckerberg is about to do uh, a full Andrew Carnegie and give it all away. So mm -hmm. the reality is that like Google, because in this Facebook is far from unique, like Amazon, the founder has an enormous stake of an incredibly valuable company, one of the most valuable companies in the world. And yet we all kind of believe that Facebook has made the world flatter. I think that's one of the great illusions of the networked world, that we're all netizens, we all somehow have equal access, we can all speak truth to power. Yeah, but when you look at the network structure, it's not egalitarian at all. A few people have crazy numbers of connections. Look at how many followers uh, Donald Trump has compared with little old us. Mm -hmm. uh, and more importantly, a very few people own a really huge chunk of the infrastructure of the online social networks. Uh, and the rest of us are just the mugs. We're the users. We are the mugs who gave Mark Zuckerberg our data for free. Mm -hmm. We gave him our data. And that is really why Facebook is such a valuable company. It knows more about us than we do. It can predict what we're going to do better than we can. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an astonishing state of affairs. I don't think it's nefarious. One has to take one's hat off to Mark Zuckerberg as a businessman. He had to make some very big judgment calls as Facebook grew from what was originally a little sharing platform for Harvard undergrads. And he made those big calls and he got them right. I I'd, I'd take my hat off to him as a businessman. But I think he underestimated, as most of us did, what the implications were of building such an enormous platform that's now the biggest uh, network probably there's ever been. He was over-optimistic. He thought there would be this global community and then we'd all solve climate change. And what he got was 2016. Hmm. Do you think there's any sense of remorse yeah. among the people at Definitely. Facebook? Yes. Now, the atmosphere in Silicon Valley has changed dramatically in this uh, relatively short space of time that I've lived in Northern California. There was tremendous hubris and arrogance back in uh, you know, the period before the election. Uh, and it only was after the election and, and slowly that people came out of denial. And now there's a kind of what have we done mood. What did we do? And a lot of former Facebook people are publicly... Uh, beating themselves up about this. I wrote a piece uh, for the Globe and Mail about this just uh, the other week, admitting uh, that they underestimated uh, the downside risks, certainly from a political point of view, 
but also acknowledging, and I think this is an important point, that they did know how addictive Facebook was going to be. Mm -hmm. And for those of uh, your viewers watching with adolescent kids, uh, this is not news. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook is addictive, mm -hmm. uh, and a very large proportion of younger people are on the network and use it compulsively, checking all the time uh, on their smartphones and on their other devices. And I think one important realization for me of the last 12 months is that the people who built this network knew it was addictive and designed it to be addictive. And the confessions in, in, in that respect, I think, are important because we're all gradually realizing that for teenagers especially, online social networks are bad for your health, for your mental health. Mm -hmm. More and more evidence is coming out that a generation has come into existence with smartphones, with online networks, and that, that generation of teenagers is miserable. Mm. Compared with the happy teenagers we were, Steve, like we had none of this to worry about. We just went outside and played road hockey. Right. You know, those were innocent, well, maybe not in Scotland, happy but days. We, but we had an equivalent, which was yeah. a, a violent version of soccer in which contact was encouraged. Mm -hmm. But we certainly didn't worry whether people were liking our latest posts on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for the teenagers. I have teenage kids, and I look, I look at what this has done to them, and I think, you know what? That they knew in the design and the platforms that they would be addictive, that's reprehensible. Mm -hmm. And I think we should all reassess our view of how kids should use these platforms. Personally, as I bring up my youngest children, I have a six-year-old right now and a three-month-old, I mean, those, those guys are going nowhere near screens until they're well in uh, to maturity. Are you on Facebook? I am. Do you use it a lot? No, I actually don't. I, I use it passively. I'll tell you how it works. I, I use Twitter. Every time I write anything, I'll tweet our interview so that people who are interested can see the conversation that we had and then automatically that, that tweet will appear on my Facebook feed. Ah. I never check Facebook to see what my friends or my kids are up to. I'm done with that. I think it was always a little bit weird and sick. And now I just like to hear from them in the regular way, meet, have a drink, talk in real time, in real space. All that old fashioned stuff. What a stuff. crazy idea. Yeah, it <laughs> turns out to be really good for your mental health. Let, let me take you back to the campaign for a second, the 2016 presidential campaign. Because there's a kind of irony here in as much as these people you write about are all in California, yeah. which is the biggest of the blue states, mm. and clearly they were all for Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And yet, for some reason, her team failed to exploit the possibilities of Facebook, and while she certainly won the popular vote, she didn't become the president. Yeah. Kind of turned out ass backwards for them, didn't it? Yeah, you could hear their heads exploding uh, all over Northern California the morning after the election. And I think there are two reasons why that happened. One was a certain complacency. Because after all, hadn't Barack Obama pioneered uh, social media in 2008 when John McCain didn't even have email? I think there was an assumption amongst Democrats that they kind of owned Silicon Valley. Therefore, how could it possibly be used against them? The second thing they did was to underestimate Trump consistently throughout the election campaign. They assumed that this uh, crude, uh, loud-mouthed uh, son of a gun couldn't possibly understand the finer points of social media. Brad Pascal, who was a Trump social media director, said something very interesting towards the end of last year. He said, you know, all these liberal types designed uh, the social networks, and it never occurred to them that those could be used by conservatives against them. And I think that was dead right. It never occurred to the folks at Google uh, or at Facebook that the Trump campaign far better understood how to use these tools than the Clinton campaign. And it came as a tremendous shock to realize that the network platforms built in Silicon Valley had been Trump's secret weapons. And I think we're still in the midst of an inquiry into what happened in 2016. I think there's more still to come out about how the network platforms were used. But that's the key fact. If they hadn't been there, and if Trump's campaign hadn't understood how to use them, I'm pretty sure Hillary Clinton would have won, and Silicon Valley would have celebrated, and Google would have carried on having an incredibly close relationship with the government, which it had under Obama. Well, that all stopped with a sudden horrible shock uh, in, uh, in the early hours of November the 9th, 2016. Indeed. As you compare the power that those in Silicon Valley have and their network to the network that Donald Trump has vastly out over many countries around the world, um, whose power is more and in whose hands is the power more appropriately uh, used for the good of the public? That's a great question. 
I think the, the right answer is probably we'll soon find out because I think a, a collision is going to happen between President Trump and Silicon Valley. It was already beginning to become apparent around the time of the terrible events in Charlottesville last year, which, I, which prompted a great deal of very explicit anti-Trump uh, statements from Silicon Valley uh, executives. But there are, there are two ways of thinking about this. Number one, however he came to power, Trump is the president of the United States, which makes him institutionally the most powerful man in the world. No question, he is at the top of the hierarchy that is the federal government of the United States. Uh, he has all the tools at his disposal uh, of anybody who is the president of the United States. And meanwhile, Silicon Valley's billionaires may be wealthy and they may control very valuable companies, but if the federal government decided to regulate them, either through antitrust or by some other means, uh, it would really not be easy for them to win that fight. Now, I think antitrust is less likely to happen. Certainly, it's not the kind of thing Republicans do, and so I wouldn't expect that to be where this battle is fought. But imagine if, in the course of the coming year, Republicans waken up to the fact that the algorithms have been tweaked to their disadvantage so that 2016 will never happen again. In fact, social media will help the Democrats in 2018. And they then say, OK, we need to look at regulation again. You guys are monopolies. You're basically utilities. We're going to regulate you in, in a way similar to the way we regulate regular media companies. Then there's going to be a tremendous fight. And in that fight, I think the federal government will win, especially if the public increasingly understands that Facebook has too much power too much power for any company. Uh, and so I think in that battle, it will be right for the Trump uh, administration to regulate Facebook and Google differently. Because and you currently that? Yeah, I do. Because mm -hmm. currently they're not regulated in the way that media companies are. We live in a fictitious world where these are technology platforms without any liability for the content that appears on them. And I think that's not a level playing field at all. Regular media publishers are liable for the content they publish. That's why they have editors. That's why you have an editor who's listening to what we say to make sure we don't say something that's heinously untrue. So I think that that's the regulation that needs to change. And it's not that we're regulating in a way that I think uh, would be harmful economically. I think it'd be beneficial to have a le level playing field so that the biggest media publisher in the world, which is now Facebook, actually is accountable for the stuff that appears on the platform. The mid-1990s legislation, which predates Facebook, essentially created an exemption for tech companies to help them get going so that they wouldn't have to worry about what appeared on the platforms. That is completely anachronistic in 2018 when these are now some of the biggest companies in the world. They enjoy an unfair advantage over traditional media publishers. And I think that's the thing that needs to get fixed. And I see absolutely no credible argument against that. So what we have at the moment is Facebook and others saying, oh, leave it to us. We'll, we'll improve. We'll fix Facebook. That was Zuckerberg's phrase at the beginning of the year. Uh, we'll tweak the algorithm. That's not good enough. Because why would they really change the business model? It's such a tremendous business model. You're essentially taking advantage of all the data you have to sell to advertisers around the world. And you don't look too closely at who the advertisers are, even if they're paying in rubles for political content. That's the story of 2016. If that isn't an argument for a tougher regulatory framework, I don't know what is. Any part of you somewhat uncomfortable about the fact that you might be on the same page as Donald Trump on that file? Look, part of the problem with the Trump administration has been that because of the president's personality and his views on a whole range of issues, which I find deplorable, whether it's his sexism or his racism, you can't actually say on a particular policy this administration is right without being denounced as an apologist for Trump's sexism and racism. But you have to draw a distinction between the Trump personality and the crazy stuff he says, I won't repeat some of his recent language on air, mm -hmm. and the policies of the administration. There is a distinction. The United States isn't a monarchy. The separation of powers is real. It's designed to institutionalize power so that the president can't turn the United States into a tyranny. And I think if a Trump administration were to say, we need to change the regulations so that there's a level playing field for all media content publishers, then I would be in favor of that, regardless of what President Trump tweets tomorrow. Hmm. We always appreciate your visits here at TV O'Neill Ferguson, and we can't wait to have you back with volume two of Henry Kissinger. In the meantime, uh, we would recommend Neil Ferguson's latest, The Square and the Tower, networks and power from the Freemasons to Facebook. Great to see you again. Thank you, Steve.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.